In their ongoing quest to revive and preserve ancestral grains, a Clemson University scientist and his collaborators have begun the process of restoring a nearly extinct variety of wheat that traces its American roots to the 1700s. Purple straw is the only heirloom wheat to have been cultivated continually in the South from the colonial period into the last quarter of the 20th century. It remained a crop wheat until the 1970s when it was then abandoned and replaced by more productive modern hybrids. Now, only a few seeds remain of this tasty, nutritious, and hardy winter grain, but they're in good hands. Uh, this is a Clemson's Coastal Research and Education Center um, organic research farm, and we're doing a seed increase for uh, a valuable seed that was once prominent here in the south, but um, has since gone away. This method is actually a method of uh, what's called a system of crop intensification. And so with a typical uh, uh, wheat uh, growing system, you have really high density uh, growing conditions where uh, you have uh, lots of seed up to 110, 150 pounds to the acre of, of seed. And so the plants are like every three inches by three inches, three inches by six inches within or between rows. And in this system, you plant the, the plant in, uh, uh, further apart. In a traditional system, all that, that high density, the plants uh, compete with one another don't have the ability to tiller, which basically means produce multiple shoots at the base, okay? And this type of system, which we've actually proven here, works with rice. We're seeing how well it works here with, uh, um, with uh, this wheat. Um, uh, you'll get multiple, multiple panicles or tillers, okay? Each one of those tillers will, con will contain a panicle of, of grain on it. And so considering this is our first year, we were very limited. We had, I think, less than a pound of seed. And so we're growing it like this to maximize our ability to um, produce the maximum amount of seed we can in the given amount of seed that we had. Uh, in this trial for here, for the field, I've got a backup in the greenhouse just in case we get uh, bad weather and this fails. Out of this, I'm hoping to get probably um, 90 to 120 pounds minimum, uh, more likely between three and 600 pounds, okay, in this system, um, if given the proper weather, okay, that's, that's mother nature rules on that, that aspect. In the greenhouse, I have uh, um, 500 plants um, in the greenhouse, and I'm not quite sure exactly how much we'll get from that, but that's just a seed back that we'll definitely get our pound back. We'll probably get probably 20 to 30 pounds out of the greenhouse at least. Here we'll, like we did with the, the Carolina African Runner Peanut, and like I've done with some other, other uh, products, I'll take um, and take about 70% of the seed we get this year, and I'll take it and I'll grow it into an additional field that's organic, okay? And we'll ramp that up, okay? Uh, maybe the same method depends on how much this produces this year. We'll ramp that up, and then probably by the by the year three, we'll have enough, you know, uh, um, uh, maybe a couple thousand pounds that we can actually start giving to growers around the state, and then they can actually start ramping their production up, uh, and then then this basically this, uh, we've achieved biosecurity for that one crop for this 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 area. In the greenhouse, this is my this is our biosecurity backup plants, and right now uh, they're they're growing in these these one gallon pots. But in about a week or so, we're going to actually take these plants out, and we're going to actually um, plant these in uh, three gallon pots, and then ultimately into five gallon pots. And you can tell already that the tillers, the, the number of shoots coming out of the base are. Uh, really good and if we give uh, the plant more room to grow we should have plenty plenty of uh, tillers coming um, shoots and so this this should be a success story and um, ultimately um, uh, we'll be harvesting this again in um, April and May. Purple straw wheat is one of two wheats that uh, have survived in the south from the colonial period well into the 20th century and there's several reasons why one was a culinary reason. It was discovered to be an excellent wheat for uh, whiskey. We did whiskey for uh, biscuits and for cake. If uh, you know anything about southern uh, baking, there's a decided preference for soft, white winter wheat. And purple straw was a winter wheat. Indeed, uh, it prevailed over all of the other winter wheats over its history because it had the shortest growing period of any of the wheats and avoided numbers of diseases such as rust or fusarium head wilt and managed to avoid also the uh, terrible insect that came and afflicted uh, southern wheat in the middle of the 19th century, the uh, joint worm. Uh, purple straw wheat uh, is 
As you can imagine, a uh, wheat that has a stem which has a purplish, reddish, bluish color at the top. Uh, it has uh, a red husk and mills white, and it mills very fine. Uh, the quality was admired by anyone who uh, was a miller uh, and also those who used it in the kitchen. My colleague David Shields uh, uncovered uh, one very simple fact about purple straw wheat that uh, changes the game for the arc of development of cereal husbandry from the antebellum south into modern times. And that is prior to his discovery, everyone thought purple straw wheat somehow just originated as if by magic in 1822 when it actually was very present and robust prior to the revolution. So it's a colonial era introduction. Um, the other thing is its persistence and vigor was not noted as an important factor after 1822, but before 1822 it was a premium whiskey wheat, who doesn't like whiskey? It was a premium biscuit wheat, who doesn't like biscuit? And in Charleston, we're internationally famous for our cake culture, you know, like birthday cake, stuff like that, Lady Baltimore cake. It is the absolute most phenomenal pastry grade cake flour made from it. The fact that it's disease resistant, the fact that it's so persistent that it was present even in the depression and everybody was just taking it for granted, essentially it's a staple currency. And there's very few identity preserved cultivars that have that kind of presence in the South, let alone in America. So this is huge. Uh, I was gifted a small amount of purple straw wheat flour from Glenn Roberts and Anson Mills uh, for a fundraising dinner that we did for the Coastal Organic Research Extension. Uh, we didn't have a lot of it, so we didn't want to uh, do a whole lot with it. We did a very simple puff pastry and a uh, sort of a take on a historic dessert with some African runner peanuts. Uh, we're really excited to work with that. And we noticed when we baked the pastry that um, there were really some sort of floral overtones that, uh, that came out. It was really exciting for us uh, in the kitchen and uh, there was a lot of passion going on that day uh, because we were working with such a, uh, a unique uh, ingredient with such specific ties to South Carolina history. Um, and I think that that's something that's in integral to what CORE is doing. Um, and I don't think that there's really anything going on uh, like it anywhere else in the United States. I think a lot of people come to Charleston for tourism and uh, for culinary, uh, you know, adventures. Um, but I think that, um, you know, increasingly you're going to see with the restoration of these uh, lost grains from the 19th century that, uh, you know, people are going to be able to uh, not only enjoy a protected biodiversity, but also enjoy, uh, you know, a better palate and some ties to history. So